All right. Uh, good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to day two of the 2021 IoT and Edge uh, days. Uh, we're starting today's sessions with uh, Mike Milankovic. Uh, Mike is the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, Mike is going to be speaking today to you about the application of open source technologies to IoT and Edge computing. Uh, uh, the session would, would take about 25 minutes, and uh, we're expecting to have five minutes by the end of the session for any questions you have addressed straight to Mike. So if you have any questions, please, uh, on the right side of your screen, uh, just type them down or click on Ask a Question button, and then we'll be uh, more than happy to take your questions. So uh, stage is yours, Mike. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Hassan, and, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, it's still virtual. Um, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll get back to more normal times uh, so shortly. But I hope everyone is safe and well, and, uh, um, and we're very happy to have you here joining us today. Um, and I just actually want to call out uh, Hassan and Hudson and Frederick and my Clips Foundation colleagues that have worked so hard to make this uh, event a reality. It's, it's really great to, uh, to see um, so many uh, community members um, uh, joining us, and, and uh, we had great numbers yesterday, and hopefully even better today. Um, so my talk here today is that how open source is both going to disrupt the embedded world and empower the next wave of innovation. Uh, I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on in the world that we used to think of as embedded, and I've sort of dabbled in embedded for, you know, 30 years, uh, from mostly from the tools perspective, as you would expect. Um, from uh, uh, from the Eclipse uh, world, uh, but you know, in, in past careers with places like Object Technology International, and even my my original uh, roots in in Bell Northern Research. But as I go through this talk today, um, it's important that as you listen, that you keep two things in mind when I talk about open source. Um, the first is when I talk about how open source impacts business. Uh, I'm referring to what are sometimes called hybrid business models. Uh, I've had certain audiences that when you say open source business models, they immediately think of, you know, everything has to be open source um, and everything has to be free. And that is not the way I look at the world. Not 100% of all software needs to be open source. I just think that open source is the most successful model out there today for collaboration and innovation on creating shared public value in the form of software platforms. Think Linux, Kubernetes, FreeRTOS, Node.js, Android. Um, once you have these uh, open source platforms, then companies then compete to capture value and make money on top of these shared platforms. And that's really the kind of business model um, that I think is, is going to continue to, to, to move forward. Um, and that will, so keep that in mind when I'm talking about business models in this talk. The second thing is, is that the embedded industrial world is on a journey to digitalization or digital transformation. And it's my position that open source is a necessary part of this journey. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Of course, digitalization requires adopting agility and software-centric processes, but it's my belief that your organization cannot claim to have completed their digital transformation until they've mastered the art of open source. That's not the same thing as saying that mastering open source means that you've completed your digital transformation. Again, open source is, is a, a necessary but not sufficient uh, part of, of digital transformation. The embedded world and industrial world is going through an enormous transformation. And one of the outcomes I predict is the emergence of platforms in the embedded world. Uh, and that's going to fundamentally change the bespoke world that has existed in embed in embedded since its inception. Um, you know, everything in embedded has always been about, you know, very low cost bill of materials and, you know, you're fine tuning the hardware and the software. Um, but I do predict that, uh, that the, there will be the emergence of platforms and that's going to change things. And there's going to be platforms in three different areas. There's going to be cloud, including hybrid cloud, which is going to enable massive data storage and analysis. And that's really going to help drive a lot of the new systems and business models. Then edge computing is the application of distributing computing infrastructure that we've mastered in the cloud and taking that technology and bringing it to the edge. And one of the key differentiators in, in this is between cloud and, and edge is, is that in edge, location matters. Um, you know, if you basically, if you know where that computer is, then that probably, that's, that's an edge computer, not a cloud computer. Um, and by, I don't mean like regions or zones, I mean, it's on that corner, street corner. 
Um, IoT is the use of open standards and open technologies to replace the bespoke and industry-specific protocols and infrastructure of the past. And really, I mean, when I talk about the difference between IoT and Edge, um, it's not really so always about the architectures um, or the use cases. They can often be very similar. My experience is that people who talk about IoT are coming from an embedded background and they're really embracing the notion of having open technologies drive this plot, these, uh, these technologies forward. Um, whereas edge computing is kind of coming from a cloud perspective and bringing technologies like Kubernetes and gRPC and others to the edge. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, how, that's how I differentiate those two primarily. A recent survey showed that uh, the vast majority of organizations are factoring open source um, into their IoT and edge deployment strategies. And the top three business advantages that they've noticed in, is uh, as their motivation for doing so are things like customization. And really, I think of customization as almost synonymous with, with innovation, is being able to take the code and, and making it fit the purpose um, for the exact use case at hand. Reducing costs and providing more control um, are other uh, prime motivators um, in why open source um, uh, is, is helping to lead um, in IoT and deployment uh, de eh, development strategies. One of the areas where in, in the IoT um, and embedded space that uh, we have seen the most impact uh, from open source has been protocols. And to a large degree, the IoT is all about replacing domain-specific proprietary or walled garden specifications with ones that are truly open. And one of the best examples of this is MQTT, uh, which saw a rapid acceleration of adoption uh, once the spec was moved into OASIS and implementations moved to the Eclipse Foundation. That started with Eclipse PAHO back um, basically a decade ago, um, followed by Eclipse Mosquito, and then most recently Eclipse Anwin. Um, but we see this trend towards open source implementations of, of standards uh, or of protocol specifications in all of the other protocols as well. So DDS, CoAP, OPC UA, um, lightweight M2M, um, and uh, these are all being moved forward um, by uh, open source implementations. And you see this, by the way, in, in many other spaces where the combination of open source and open specifications or open standards uh, really is the industry best practice on, on moving forward with rapid adoption of technology. So what is open source? Um, in, in our world, um, open source is the platform. It's the foundation upon which great businesses are built today. And as I said in the beginning, this is not entirely about free software. It's about co-creating a public value platform that then in, uh, enables innovative new businesses on top. And so what you're seeing is a, open source is providing a mechanism by which competitors can collaborate uh, without running afoul of antitrust regulations um, and to, to, to deliver these public value um, open source platforms. You know, when we talk about open source, what we're seeing now is 80 to 90% of code in typical software products or applications. Uh, the actual running code is, is based on open source. And that's really freeing up people to, to focus their energies on the what is the differentiating value for their, um, for their pieces, uh, for their product or application. It's the openness, transparency, participation, and collaboration that really helps to drive these platforms forward. Um, and you know, open source is now the first choice for innovation and commercialization across industries. And we're really seeing this in Eclipse IoT, um, where industry leaders like Bosch, Eurotech, and, and Red Hat on, our, on the steering committee of the IoT working group, and others like ARM and HiveMQ, IBM, Intel, are all active participants. Um, so you're seeing some industry giants really leading the charge um, in on bringing the open source to the IoT and edge compute world. To a large degree, this is really about driving shared goals. And you know, ultimately, we feel that open source is simply a better way to do business in this rapidly changing world. It helps lower your development costs. It mitigates business risks. It accelerates the market adoption of technologies and standards. And, and let's, let's face it, you know, if you want a technology to be rapidly adopted and widely adopted, free is a really good price. Um, doing rapid distribution and adoption is really how technologies move forward today. It's a very, very different world from, from 20, minute, 20, uh, 20 years ago. 
in the style of open collaborative development um, that is encouraged by open source is fundamentally changed in the way technology evolves. Um, so if you look at Kubernetes as an example, you have Alibaba, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and others all collaborating with one another at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And we're seeing that play out in the IoT space as well. And it's really about co-creating um, co -creating value, you know, then, then competing on top of the platform um, that shares the, you know, shares the costs on the lead development for the platform and freeing the talent to focus on strategic and differentiating capabilities. One of the things that's just really happened over the last couple of years um, is more studies that are showing the tangible business benefits that companies who embrace open source are seeing. And these, some of these business benefits are very large. Um, so the McKinsey study here that's referenced um, showed that um, 3X, uh, the pace of innovation was being attained by the companies that embraced open source as part of their innovation strategy. So when they looked at uh, they looked at companies that were doing digital transformation, and they really found that there was a um, extremely noticeable difference between the success in the digital transformation that was being enjoyed by the companies um, that were embracing open the active participation in open source. The Harvard Business School study um, showed that companies that contributed open source rather than simply uh, adopting open source or using open source saw a hundred percent productivity uh, improvement amongst their development teams. And anytime you can, you know, double the productivity of a development team, um, that's that's something that you really want to you, know, you really want to embrace. And the reason why they saw this uh, increase in productivity is that the skills and engagement and the ability to make improvements in the open source code um, was really helping accelerate the uh, the abilities of the team. And the fact that uh, this business value is being noticed was supported in our in our recent um, uh, our recent survey. And so what we're seeing is the business drivers for open source and IoT and edge tech computing are focused on creating new value and new business models. Right, with seventy four percent of organizations are factoring open source into their deployment plans. That's a really good sign that that people are understanding um, and embracing um, this this new way of doing business. But it's important to understand that embracing open source is a journey um, for every organization. Uh, and every organization has to go through these steps. Uh, and by the way, pretty much go through these steps in this order uh, has been our experience. For many years, the Eclipse Foundation has been using a maturity model to, to, to look at this transformation. And, um, you know, IT vendors um, have all gone through this um, over the last 20 years. Uh, and now use open source as part of their business strategies and accelerating their product development. Enterprises are currently going through this um, and starting to move up, uh, particularly from use um, into um, contribution. Um, and But next up are industrials in the embedded world. And for, with relatively few ex exceptions, the companies that we see in embedded in IoT and edge um, that are embracing open source are in that first use step. Um, the number of companies relative to the overall market size um, that are contributing to open source is relatively small. So they're making use of open source to reduce costs, mitigate risk, provide fast, faster time to market, you know, all of the good things that open source provides. But that's not how success is defined in, in, in this new world. And it's important to realize that, you know, when open source first became prevalent and even, uh, you know, 15 years ago, Open source was primarily a, a technique um, from, a, from a business perspective of commoditizing existing technologies. And so, you know, think of the LAMP stack as one example of that. Now, all new major software technology starts in open source. Uh, and so what we're seeing is that open source is, the, is how innovation and new technology adoption is driven. This began years ago with Hadoop and big data, uh, but now we're seeing in other new areas like AI, machine learning, distributed ledger technologies, edge computing, all of these sectors are using open source to drive both innovation and adoption of these new technologies. If you've gone from commoditization to innovation, you know, why has that happened? And it's simply, the, the fact is, is that open source is a, a better way of innovating. Um, this model of 
permissionless innovation that has been um, driven by open source where developers can experiment um, by cobbling together solutions based on open source components and effectively doing innovation through integration is simply a faster, better way to build software systems. Um, and so that's really what's driving this, this move from commoditization to innovation. So where does this all lead us? Um, so if we look at the biggest business drivers that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, it's been the emergence of the platform economy. And the, the, this slide here is showing um, a survey that was done in February 2020, looking at the top 100 platform companies in the world. At that time, the value, um, overall value was $8.9 trillion. I'm sure that number has gone up substantially based on the, the star, stock market run in tech has happened over the last year. Um, and the value of these companies far outweighs the traditional industrial sectors. You know, the canonical example of this is the, you know, the, the, the market value of Tesla versus, you know, all of the other automotive companies combined. Um, and one factor that virtually all these platform companies have in common is they are driven by delivering value to consumers via software. Um, and it, they've also all mastered the art of using and contributing to open source. Now, correlation is not causation, but the fact that the most valuable companies in the world are all involved in open source says a great deal about the role that open source plays in innovation. To play a prominent role uh, in the global platform economy, modern organizations are joining forces to collaborate in open source, and they're taking using this to take advantage of op on entrepreneurial opportunities that are provided there uh, and the ability to compete on a digital scale. So. If the platform economy is what's you know what has really driven value over the last 10, 15 years, you know what's going to happen next? And we look at some of the major trends that are happening out there. IoT and edge computing, of course, is one, and that's why everybody is here today. Uh, machine and AI learning um, is is uh, another major trend, and it's been interesting to note that uh, machine learning and AI has been one of the things that uh, we normally um, or often shows up in. Edge computing is the primary re, uh, driver for, for edge computing. Um, cloud, and one of the things I want to note, note about cloud is that we, we really think that the emergence of Kubernetes um, helped accelerate cloud adoption by making it safer. Um, it was the emergence of hybrid cloud that allowed enterprises to embrace cloud with greater safety due to lack of vendor lock-in and the ability to, to ch choose workloads between on-prem and, and, and public cloud um, is given them lack of, you know, reduced vendor lock-in and made cloud a safer choice for enterprises. And it was that Kuber that the, the emergence of Kubernetes as this safe platform had really helped accelerate um, the adoption of cloud, both hybrid cloud, but, but also made public cloud a safer choice because it, it simply existed. Distributed ledger technologies is another area, emerging area. And then finally, industry 4.0, you know, uh, or smart manufacturing, but you know, one of the things that I, is that in the first four of those, we really see open source leading the way in terms of how these technologies are being are being driven. Not so much in Industry 4.0, and I really think that the lack of open source is, is notable um, there, and that's definitely one thing that we at the Cliff Foundation are um, would like would love to fix. So we really think that the machine opportunity, which builds on these four trends, um, is the is the next big thing. Uh, just like the internet created the platform economy, the internet of things and edge computing are going to create the machine economy. Um, and in terms of evolving towards the machine economy, we're, these are there's multiple stages that are going to be going through. We're sort of at the smart machine and kind of getting into smart analytics um, using AI and ML techniques. That's going to help then drive the creation of smart services um, where new business model and marketplaces come up and share assets and services and distributed ecosystem. And then that's going to set the stage for smart value creation um, where machines become autonomous market participants and, and interacting with each other independently. Um, and so we really see this machine machine economy as the successor to the platform economy is driving economic value for the next 15, 20 years. In, in terms of evolving the, the machine economy, um, it's going to require the emergence of platforms to enable the kinds of two-sided ecosystems that we see in the platform economy. 
Um, and we predict that these platforms are going to be going to be open source. Now, the platforms are going to take um, these four major trends, um, IoT and edge computing, machine learning and AI, cloud, and then build on top of distributed ledger technologies. Um, and that's, you know, those, the combination of those four technologies are really what's going to define what the machine economy platforms are going to look like. Now, initially, and we are, you already see this, um, you know, these platforms um, may be proprietary. Um, and I'm not saying that there won't be very successful proprietary platforms of this, of this type. Um, but for the machine economy to really take off, uh, we're going to see something like what we saw with Kubernetes where an open source um, an open source platform undoubtedly from a vendor neutral uh, foundation with vendor neutral governance enabling a multi-vendor ecosystem that platform um, is going to emerge and drive the machine economy uh, and this you know this might take years to unfold uh, but I think that the uh, history is going to repeat itself in this case. So this is a global opportunity. Um, we really think that this is the, the, next, the next big wave of economic value. Um, and the companies that succeed in the machine economy are the ones that are gonna start now, uh, embracing digitalization and digital transformation, using open source as a strategic tool for open collaboration and innovation, um, and helping build the skills and the capacity to lead the machine economy. So with that, I thank you, um, and uh, I hope the talk was of interest, and I hope we have some some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for uh, for the great insights. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I, th I think it's safe to say that uh, open source it is truly the way to go, uh, and and uh, especially if we are, uh, you know, talking about the innovation within different different. Uh, uh, industries mainly IoT and and ads. So so um, one thing we we are usually you know internally at the foundation we're, we're very proud of is that that the Eclipse Foundation has always been uh, not only home for uh, the big industry players and big giants like Bosch's, Red Hats, etc., Siemens, etc., but also you know home for the startups and uh, and and. Uh, that we highly see the value that they're uh, contributing to the overall community. So, uh, so the first question is from my side. What What do you think is the best advice that we can really uh, give today for uh, startups who wish to join the foundation and, and the IoT and, and Edge and Sparkplug working group? Yeah. Well, the, what what I would say is that the Eclipse Foundation is clearly. Um, in the way that we've set up our governance and our membership structures and our, even our membership dues, um, we are the most startup friendly um, open source foundation out there. Uh, just to give you a tangible example, um, you know, uh, we set, we always, um, as a matter of principle, structure our dues so that even the smallest of companies can join our working group steering committees or our board of directors without paying hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, in, in the in the most extreme examples, like, you know, strategic membership or um, in the foundation or Jakarta EE. Um, and that has led us to being a better governed organization. So the contributions in Jakarta EE from um, small strategic members like uh, Tommy Tribe and Payera um, have been extremely helpful. Uh, over the years, um, small companies that were at the Eclipse Foundation Board of Directors, um, like um, Obeo, for example, um, you know, having that perspective uh, in the boardroom uh, for um, and making sure that we're taking the interests of smaller companies um, to heart um, as we're devising our, our our next moves and our governance and our strategies has been, um, in, you know, absolutely instrumental in in the success of our organization. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, hopefully that uh, that helps answer the question. Yeah, uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, so I have I have a question from Chan Dizay. Uh, he's asking how does the foundation address the major problem in open source space of project abandonment, and how does the foundation not get driven by large enterprises who become partners slash members and still keep a general perspective for all in mind? Um. So in terms of sustainability, uh, you know. We do things at the Clit Foundation um, to help keep projects uh, going 
uh, that you simply cannot do if you're just you know a single vendor product a project or or just you know a project on um, on uh, on GitHub. It's you know a, a recent example is uh, is BERT, um, the Business Intelligence and Reporting Tool project, where uh, the project had gone basically dead because its original founder and sponsor um, actuate and then open, it was acquired by OpenText had, had effectively moved on and lost interest. Um, we com we completely rebooted that project. We basically fired all of the committers and project and the project lead and brought in a whole new team of, of interested parties that were, wanted to keep the project going and you know have given that project a new life um and we could do that because it was an eclipse foundation project and we had the ability and the right to intercede to make sure that the um the value that that project was bringing to the community continued so that's one of the things that we do for um for sustainability um and sorry um what makes Eclipse Foundation different from the Linux Foundation and Apache and the IoT and Edge space? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, we have um, the uh, leading community, I would say, in terms of actual running code. Number of like, if you if you do all of the metrics in terms of number of projects, amount of code, amount of contributions, uh, pace of evolution, and so on. Eclipse IoT is by far and away the leading open source community um, in, uh, in, in this space. Now, we don't have the time to talk about the relative differences in governance and so on between, between the three organizations, but um, you know, just suffice it to say that if you were to plot a line between, so the, or the matrix between you know, having um, uh, community-driven open source versus corporate-driven open source and having the, um, um, the ability to have professional staff versus 100% volunteer. I think, you know, Eclipse Foundation really hits the sweet spot between because we have professional staff and can execute on things. Uh, at the same time, um, we are open, transparent, and meritocratic. Um, and just because you're a member of the Eclipse Foundation doesn't give you the ability to, to drive um, the decisions in any project here. All right, sounds good. So we'll, I guess we'll take the last question. Uh, we're, we're over time, but in less than a minute, uh, Mike, uh, uh, so do, do you think that it's that there is a direct correlation to the free model open source embraces uh, being at odds with the revenue streams of industrial suppliers that, that use proprietary software hardware as a revenue generation model? And if so, uh, uh, is, is there a revenue model other than free that open source can embrace? That's a question from Greg Phelps. Well, I, I thought I answered that question when I talked about the, you know, when I talk about open source business models, I talk about a hybrid uh, hybrid business model. So I'm all for people making money um, and, in, and using um, open source code in delivering innovative value um, in their products. Um, so I, I don't, I just don't buy the argument or the assertion that open source and business um or our 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 orthogonal concerns um and i don't have the question in front of me so i hope that actually addressed it properly um if not feel free to drop me a line and love to have a debate sounds great so uh uh again uh thank you thank you mike uh for the amazing session uh today um uh I'd like to remind everyone that uh, in case you would like to reach to any of the foundation members uh, directly, please feel free uh, to reach us at the contact us uh, forms at the Eclipse Foundation website. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you one more time, Mike, and uh, we'll speak soon. All right, thanks.